Hi there, so today I'm going to tell you about uh, a new technique for analyzing images of the 21 centimeter signal um, for and in, in the context of EOR parameter inference. And so most of this talk will be going through uh, the basis of this new technique with a few results at the end if time permits. So just a brief refresher, here's what we expect to be able to observe with the 21 centimeter signal. So this equation here is the brightness temperature contrast against the CMB. You see here that it's dependent over on the left by the neutral fraction, so the ionizing morphology of reionization. You've also got your cosmology, so gas density, light aside velocity gradients in your cosmology terms, and your spin temperature is the thermal state of the IGM. So this equation, this brightness temperature, it's a 3D signal, and it's um, quite sensitive to the uh, epoch of reionization right through to the period of the cosmic dawn. And here's just a, a basically a 2D projection of this brightness temperature through the timeline of the universe. Now with uh, EUR experiments, such as the interferometers, we expect to be able to measure this signal in 3D. So here is uh, what's termed uh, light cone. So this is the light cone of the brightness temperature signal. You have your transverse spatial uh, scale, so that's on your sky. And then you measure different frequencies along the line of sight. So you can build up this 3D picture of the time evolution of the neutral hydrogen from the dark ages down to the EOR. So we have global experiments, which aim to basically on your sky, reduce it down to one number and measure that one number along the line of sight direction. So you can measure this kind of behavior here. This is what the um, global signal of the brightness temperature looks like. With interferometer experiments, we might do something like this, where we have this 3D light cone. We'll break it up into these individual pieces. So these boxes, in each one of these boxes, we'll measure a power spectrum. So this is a power spectrum of the brightness temperature fluctuations across the line of sight. So this encodes the evolution of the brightness temperature uh, all the way through the universe. Now, however, the brightness temperature is a non-Gaussian signal. So we have this complex ionization morphology that can't be simply characterized by a Gaussian statistic such as the power spectrum. So the power spectrum is not an optimal statistic for measuring this brightness temperature signal. With these extensive experiments, we want to be able to maximize all the available information that we're going to be able to observe with the experiments. So we need to look at non-Gaussian statistics for uh, fully maximizing uh, the the products of these experiments. Now, the logical extension might be to consider the bi spectrum. So, this is the free transform of the three point correlation function. However, the noise properties of these statistics can be uh, quite problematic. So, instead, uh, what I've looked at in this work is to consider the wavelet scattering transform. And so, this is basically a nice technique which uh, deals with the noise properties in a lot uh, cleaner and easier way. So the wavelength scattering transform is basically the su successive convolution and modulus of an input image. After these kind of operations, you then take the, uh, the spatial average and it reduces your input image down to a series of coefficients. And these coefficients describe the properties of the signal that you're measuring. The convolution is performed by a family of wavelets. In this case, it's the Morlet wavelets, but uh, you can consider other uh, wavelets. Now, the key advantage of wavelets is they preserve the locality of the features of the signal. So unlike the Fourier transform, when you measure the Fourier transform, you measure the uh, power on certain scales, but you have no idea on what scale, or on what spatial location they came from. So wavelets allow you to preserve locality in either space that you're looking at. And so you know where the structures are in your signal. And so this is a crucial advantage for measuring your uh, non-Gaussian statistics. You can think of the wavelet scattering transform as sort of analogous to the hidden layers of convolutional neural network. So when you're uh, in your convolutional neural network trying to train a network, there's a bunch of filtering of your input images. And in these images, you basically allow free parameters to modify your uh, filters. They maximize the signal of your input images. And so the wavelet scattering transform is somewhat similar to that sort of filtering of the image and produce a, a maximum number, so these scattering coefficients. So far, it's been used in studies of the interstellar medium, weak lensing, and large-scale large structure. And so I've applied it to uh, theoretical images of the 21 centimeter signal. So to show you what the wavelet scattering transform does, so here's a uh, basically a 2D image of the 21 brightness temperature signal from a simulation. Here, there's, so there's a lot of information here. You don't have to absorb it all. But basically, 
over the top, you've got the zeroth order, which is just the mean of your input image. So that's just your uh, mean brightness temperature. So that's what a global signal experiment would measure. Your first order uh, information is basically your input image convolved with your wavelet filter. And so the J's and L's are basically different physical scales and rotations of your wavelet filter in 2D space. The second order information is basically just a series of convolutions. So you take your zeroth order, you take your image, you multiply it by a wavelet filter, and then you basically take the modulus and then you multiply it by another wavelet filter, and then you take the modulus and then you take the spatial average. So here from our input simulation down the bottom, we have these S1 uh, coefficients. So basically from increasing size, we're just filtering our input images on increasing size, take the modulus, measure the spatial average, and that's given by these scattering coefficient, these values down the bottom. And the same is true for the second order coefficients in the top right. And so the numbers themselves don't necessarily uh, mean anything, it's just a measure of the amplitude. So if we look at um, what they compare to relative to what we know about the brightness temperature, so we talked about this zero thought of being just the mean of the global signal. So here is for four different astrophysical models, the, the ionization fraction and, and the mean brightness temperature from our simulation. And the bottom is this S0 scattering coefficient. So you can see here that it behaves exactly as we expect. It's the global signal of the um, brightness temperature. Now, the first order scattering coefficients look remarkably similar to your power spectrum. So here, if you just take the modulus squared of your um, wavelet filtered image, spatially average, you have your power spectrum. So here in this lower pattern here in the uh, pink dash region, so you have the power spectrum at two scales. So these two different astrophysical models, the top one is at small spatial scales, the bottom one is large spatial scales. And you see this two or three hump structure, which is characteristic of the 21 centimeter power spectrum across the evolution from uh, relative six to 20. So these features uh, trace out the evolution of the brightness temperature. And you see here the S1 scattering coefficients map out this exact same structure. So at the top one, you've got these small scale structures and you see that is remarkably similar to the power spectrum on similar scales. And the bottom is the same for um, much larger scales. So you see at the top, generally you've got the two peaks and then the bottom is the three peaks. And this is characteristic of the 21 centimeter signal. Now, all of that so far is obviously on raw simulation. So that's obviously not what we're gonna be able to observe with the interferometer. So over on the left, we have our, our raw simulation output. This is what we've been looking at previously. Once you apply your uh, instrumental effects, so in the middle panel, it's uh, SKA resolution for a 1,000 hour observation, assuming we can completely remove all foregrounds. This is the kind of signal that we'd be able to expect to see. And you can still see the, the neutral patches, those dark patches where your uh, ionized regions, you can still see that in your image. Now, also, that's assuming we can completely remove our foregrounds. So we may not be able to do that. And that's the image on the right. So this is like the worst case scenario where we completely remove all modes that fall in that contamination region. So the foreground wedge, we cut all of those modes before we construct our image and we get something like this. So you can see here that complete, it drastically reduces the amplitude, but you can still see some features. And so throughout this, um, you can see here, if you compare to the raw image, so the black curves here is from the raw image, you can see how strong the signal is. And once you apply these instrumental effects, it reduces the amplitude, but you can still see these multiple peak-like structures. Now we lose the signal entirely on the first couple of scattering coefficients. And this is just purely the fact that instrumental resolution of the SK, we're not, we're not sensitive to uh, those spatial scales, which is of order uh, one or a couple of pixels in our Im uh, simulated image. But as you go up to the larger scales, you see here that you can still recover uh, the sensitive information uh, relatively well. Obviously with the wedge, cutting out those wedge modes, things get drastically worse, but it still sits above the purple curve, which is essentially just a thermal noise limit. And so just in summary, um, with those kind of things, we can sort of do a, a quick parameter estimation to understand how well these kind of uh, techniques work for recovering astrophysical parameters. So to do this, I did a, a Fisher matrix analysis. And what I'm doing here is from sort of that light cone at the start, break it up into uh, 12 individual uh, cubes measure of power spectrum. So I have 12 power spectra. In this case, I'm looking at uh, a thousand hour observation with the SK and perfect foreground removal. So this is like the, the ideal case. And these contours here, I'm looking at uh, the one sigma contours of the 21 centimeter power spectrum given in blue 
and in red is from the full wavelet scattering. So that's including the S1 and S2 coefficient. So I'm combining both the Gaussian and non-Gaussian information. And you can see here, for the most part, they're relatively the same. Uh, for one parameter down the middle, the, uh, basically a power law for the escape fraction, you can see that the wavelet scattering transform improves. So you might say, okay, well, the techniques are relatively similar. But the important thing is I've used considerably less information here for the wavelet scattering transform than I did for the power spectrum. The power spectrum, I had the light cone, I broke it up into boxes, and I measured the 3D power spectrum in each one of those boxes. So I have chip evolution in each one of those. For the wavelet scattering transform, I constructed one 2D image out of that 3D box. So I've only got one, so in this, I've only used 12 2D images, and 12 2D images are able to recover more information than the entire 3D power spectrum information across the entire light cone. And so in this investigation, the reason I was doing that was sort of to keep the uh, number of uh, basically coefficients the same. So since the coefficients are comparable to the power spectrum, so the number of Fourier bins to the number of uh, scattering coefficients in the 1D case, that was why uh, this investigation was done. Obviously, if you have this measured light cone, you're going to be able to uh, do this at a much higher cadence than, say, one image every 10 megahertz, which was the case in the previous one. And so in this case here, I'm considering uh, now foreground of audience. So the contours have blown up because here I've completely removed the uh, wedge modes. So you have less information. But I've considered different cadences of the images that I can extract from my light cone. So as I said, the yellow one will be comparable to the one I showed before. And then I consider one image every five megahertz or one image every two megahertz. And you see here, as you're folding in more information, your contours, your ability to constrain your acid foods parameters improves. And this is sort of the kind of behavior you can expect. And you can see here in the last one, it was 12 images. In the case of two megahertz, I'm now considering 80 images. And you can see uh, improvements of orders like factors to two and three. So I'll just finish there with a conclusion. So today I've just introduced the wavelet scattering transform, which is a, a neat technique for analyzing images and recovering information out of that, both Gaussian and non-Gaussian information. And the key properties here is that it's relatively straightforward and easy to implement and also understand. And it has analogies with um, the 21 centimeter power spectrum and also through convolutional neural networks. I've applied it to 2D images, but in, in practice, you can also apply this in th the 3D case. And so that might be something that's far more preferable for reionization, given we have this 3D light cone, uh, we expect to recover from interferometers. And so just in the last couple of slides, demonstrated a uh, fission matrix forecast for how well you can perform with this uh, technique, showing that it improves upon just the Gaussian case of the power spectrum. And so I'll finish there. Thank you.